Good morning, Dr. Sane. How are you? I'm excited to be here, Josh. Hope you are. I am. I am. Coming to you from sunny Florida. I hear it's sunny Florida still, are you? Now I... where's this being held? Orlando? Um uh Panama City. And oh, we're in the yeah. Redneck Riviera on the Panhandle, yeah. huh? Yeah, but the, the hotel has a nice little view of the beach, so it's not too bad. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's uh I don't I, I don't know exactly the logistics, but my wife's crab that lives in eastern Tennessee, that's the direction they go. They go to Panama City. They said yeah. it's a lot easier drive than coming to Myrtle Beach or the, the coast of North Carolina. I okay. Know. I'd have to I'd have to look. I'm not sure that they can do math, but that's what they believe anyway. Right. They live uh, south of Knoxville, down past the airport, down in the uh, where the that part of the world that developed back in the twenties and thirties with the Alcoa plant, aluminum. Yes. yes. They live down down there. Uh, Bobby's worked as a pipe fitter for Alcoa for forty years. Um, well, you know, that's all unionized, and yeah. uh, they they do real well. But you know that part of the world. It's just over the other side of the Smoky Mountain Parkway there. Yep. Um, it's amazing how many people live there. It's what my, I have this long-winded point in that part of the world because of that, the legacy of that aluminum plant. Yeah. Because uh, that is rough terrain. Yes. And uh, so, but yeah, they just go south. They don't want to go back over the mountain. I guess there's not a lot of cities in the way of travel there. I'm thinking. No, about that's what I mean. It's it's you would, that, that people live there is amazing to me. Yeah. Uh, and there's no cities. There's nothing. You just head south and you till you get to the water. There's nothing between you and there going that way. Yep. You don't have to go back around and go over the mountain. Good morning. Have we got any sound? You still? Let's hope you're still. Trying to unmute. There you go. You? You're now unmuted. Good morning. How's everybody? Can I see you they're hear? there. Yeah. See Sean. There he is. All right. <laughs> Trying to get everybody, everybody in the group. Good. Guys, please participate in conversation. It's boring when we have these guys. Makes the day go by. I'm just trying to turn you up just a little bit. Okay. All right. So Dr. Kennedy won't be joining us today. I don't blame him. He thought I was going to talk all day. <laughs> he's in the uh, he he he's in uh at Western Carolina. Well, he should be on his way back now. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Well, I won't take very long. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I have with me today, Dr. There's Dr. Kennedy right there. Look at him. Look, I'm up here in the mountains trying to find your mountain house, and I, I can't find it. You, were you with Steve Laws at NCAT this week? Yes, sir, I was. Or I was I was here yesterday. We had a, a beginning teacher of the year finalist. Mm -hmm. And they did the banquet last night? Yes, sir. Well, that's great. Yeah, he called me on the way home. They don't let him stay for the banquet. I don't blame him. They make <laughs> him leave before that happens. But he goes every year, and I get the blow by blow every day. And that's all he says. That's all that keeps him going. If if, if he, all he got to do was work with me, he'd quit. And so, but he said those young teachers, you know, spur him on every year. And so, congratulations for having the finalists. That's great. That is great. I get everybody, but I can't quite get everybody on camera. But <laughs> so today I have with me from also remotely today from Florida. He's presenting at a conference, a national conference. There is Dr. Josh Sane. Dr. Sane, um, I'll let him give you his bio. He works with us. He's an instructor for with with us in in the MSA program, and he does some doctoral work. Dr. Sane while young has an extensive background, especially in exceptional children. He is an expert. Um, and so I am pleased to him have him with us today. Dr. Singh, um, 
make sure that, uh, yeah, that you can share. There we go. We're ready to go. Thank you. Dr. Sane, hit it. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so first of all, Dr. Lamb is way too gracious. I am by no means an expert, um, but I have had my fair share of, of experiences with EC over, over my career in public ed. So um, I started out as an EC teacher and then became um, at the high school and middle school level and then became an elementary assistant principal. I have no idea why they hired me at the elementary level. I had no experience, but they did. Um, and then I became an elementary principal um, and got heavily involved at the state with the MTSS process as we were going away from the discrepancy model. Um, and then moved to the district office in Lincoln County where I was the director of academic support and learning. Uh, so I oversaw MTSS and the pathway to EC for our regular education children. Um, and then just recently um, took a job with uh, Curriculum Associates as an educational um, impl or an assessment implementation consultant where I go around the Southeast and support schools with their MTSS implementation, specifically how to um, implement an RTI that, that is sound and can accurately identify students with disabilities. So um, enough about me. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. And please know that you guys are already in this role. So, so some of this stuff may be familiar to you, but um, this is something that I did in Lincoln with all of my principals. One of the my job responsibilities was to support uh, schools with EC uh, policy implementation and, and compliance. So um, this is just one of the initial trainings that I did with, with APs that and I designed it because I wish I would have had it when I was an assistant principal. Um, as I said, I, I went from the high school to the elementary level, knew nothing about EC. And on my first day um, as an AP, I had to walk into an IEP meeting that got pretty contentious and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so the, the, this is kind of designed around that. I'm going to be referring to the um, the policies governing uh, services for children with disabilities from North Carolina, the one that was amended in 2021. There is a link there on the presentation, but basically I'm going to go through this document and hit the highlighting point or the highlights. Um, obviously, we don't have enough time to go through all of it because, as you know, it is a lot. Um, uh, but I've got the page references throughout this this presentation and also some best practices that I like to share uh, with what you need to know as you begin this this journey or as you you start increasing your time as as an LEA representative in some of your IEP meetings. Um, so. Uh, I always start with this. Um, it, not knowing is never the answer. Um, but but telling people you you don't know and you're going to get the answer that's better. But again, when you're sitting in an IEP meeting, uh, you've got to be prepared um, and and you've got to at least have a handle on the information that that you are responsible for overseeing and making sure that that um, everything is compliant with EC policy. Because if you have if if any of you have ever experienced a, a any mediation or a lawsuit regarding EC, it is not fun. Um, and, and at the district office, that's, that took up about 70% of my time is as, as we started, um, we had a lot of turnover in Lincoln County with assistant principals and we started, um, we started answering questions that we didn't really know what we were we were responding to and, and that led us down to some pathways where we had to get some mediation involved. So again, not knowing is never the answer, always ask. Um, but this is hard. Being an LEA representative is hard because you're trying to ensure that the IEP team is doing what's in the best interest of the child. But on the flip side, you've got to make sure that you're complying with all of the EC policy and law and every kid is different. Um, so, so again, hopefully you will get you'll get a, a, a stronger foundation of what you need to be doing um, in regards to EC compliance after today's presentation. All right, so we're going to start out with, with with one of the basic concepts. Hopefully, you all know what a free and appropriate public education is. Um, but on pages 23, 20 through 24, it talks specifically about how that um, uh, correlates to EC uh, compliance. But, it, but again, FAPE must be made available to any student 3 and 21, um, including students uh, who've been expelled or suspended from school. Um, here is the big part. Um, FAPE must be made available to, to as student transitions from grade to grade. So this is where in my history or in my experience, I have seen the biggest concerns and sometimes and, and sometimes we've had to go to mediation over this is that when a child transitions from fifth to sixth grade or when a child transitions from middle to high, um, that we sometimes change services based off of the middle school schedule or the high school schedule. Um, and we really have no reason why, or there's no academic reason why we're changing the service, whether it be the service time, service delivery, change in placement. Um, so we've got to make sure that as we're delivering faith, faith through these transition years, that we have conversations 
um, about the services that we're providing to students as they make those transition years and really grade to grade because sometimes grade levels have different schedules. We never can provide support based off of things that makes our lives easier as educators. Um, and then uh, last thing, FAPE must be made available to children who are incarcerated or determined eligible prior to their incarceration. And again, I failed to mention this as I know you're all in one big room, but um, I, I hate talking all the time. So please stop me. Um, I, the way the screen is monitored, I'll check the, the chat regularly, but please monitor me, unmute and just shout out your questions because I would love to have conversations if, if there's anything specific that you need to ask. All right. So child find. Um, the LEA must have procedures that identify, locate, and evaluate students who, um, who have disabilities within your region. And that is that includes children who are in private schools, children who are in home schools. Um, you must find them and you must identify and, and evaluate if, if that's the, the, the way that the IEP team decides to go. Um, each district, so your district has specific procedures for child find, but so, so um, I would make sure that, I, that we, you all know how your district um, specifically does this, um, because again, every district interprets this policy a little bit different. Every district has a little bit of a different pathway into making sure that all those children are found and identified. Uh, but just again, I, I really wanted to put in there that that does include private schools um, and, and home schools that, that don't have those services available. All right, so the least restrictive environment, uh, again, page 27, to the maximum extent appropriate children who are educated must be with children who are non-disabled. Um, removal of children with disabilities from that reg ed environment um, should only occur if the disability is, is, is um, so severe that it cannot be achieved satisfactorily in the regular ed classroom. Um, you know, in, in again, in my experience, I've been a part of IEP team meetings where we've talked about least restrictive environment and we've done, we've, we've kind of been influenced what other educators on the IEP team um, may want. So you may have a group of educators or a group of teachers who just continue to say, you know, this kid needs to be, let's say in a self-contained classroom. They cannot, they can't be in a regular education classroom. And the conversation, you can't let that opinion alone drive what the student's placement is. And I know in your district, you, you have safeguards to, for this, but, but again, safeguards or not, teachers sometimes are going to come in with some, from some pretty, pretty heavy opinions about where they think students should be placed. And you never should make decisions based off of those teacher opinions, only if truly the needs of that child cannot be met satisfactorily in the um, in the regular ed classroom. And again, your district will have specific um, requirements or, or pathways, protocols and procedures to, when, when having that conversation to just make sure that you know them. All right, um, again, the continuum of, continuum of alternative placements, each LEA must have access to or must provide access to students with disabilities who, who need that the support in those, in those alternative placements. And alternative placements are defined as regular classrooms, special classrooms, special schools, home instruction or homebound instruction or instruction in hospitals and institutions. Um, again, that last one there, the instruction in hospitals and institutions, those, those, the needs of children have increased, especially since we've come back from the pandemic, come back to school full time. Uh, mental health is, is a huge concern across um, our schools in, in North Carolina. So again, we, we must provide services, even if the district doesn't have any type of services, the district must have a plan to support that child if the IEP determines that they need those services. Um, you know, it, 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 in, in Lincoln County, we didn't have an alternative school for elementary, um, but we had students who, who possibly needed it. So we had an assistant principal who said, you know, we don't offer that, um, which which we can't do. If, if that is truly what the child needs, we must find the ways uh, or a way to provide that type of service to the students. So just remember that as you're sitting in those IEP meetings, um, never, never say we don't provide that, it, it, especially if the student and, and the data that you're going over suggests that the student does need that, that alternative placement. All right, placement decisions, and this is kind of the last generic one before we get into some of the meat. Um, all placement decisions must be made by an IEP team. Um, you all, I lived your lives being an assistant principal was one of the hardest and most challenging things that I ever did, primarily because I didn't know what I was doing half the time. Um, but but the one thing that you've got to make sure is that 
there is always an IEP team present when you make decisions. Um, that you never, for the sake of time, go around and get signatures. Um, and that happens more often than not, um, just because of, of the, the chaotic world that, that schools are right now. But again, when we're talking about EC, there must always be an IEP team meeting in place when decisions are made, especially about placement. Well, not especially, about all decisions regarding the student who's, who's been identified as EC. You want to make sure that all placement decisions conform to those least restrictive environment um, uh, policies and that the child placement is reviewed annually. So those are just basic placement decisions that you want to make sure you're doing. Um, so who who is on the IEP team? So there is there is um, a lot of, of sometimes confusion regarding this. Um, so and you'll see that as we get into some of this deeper information, I put some best practices there. But what I always told my assistant principals is that if it says best best practice, that means do it um, and do it all the time. Uh, so who is on the IEP team meeting? It is the LEA representative in most cases across the state. You know, obviously the assistant principal is the LEA rep. But what I would say that if your principal has designated themselves as an LEA rep or there's somebody else in the building that is, that doesn't mean that you don't have to know this information. Um, every assistant principal across the state should know this because there's going to come a point in time where you're going to be a part of an EC uh, a meeting, an IEP meeting. You're going to be making decisions that have to comply with, with our North Carolina policy. So again, um, it has to have an LEA rep. There should be parents or guardians always present. And here are the, the, the other key people. Other persons knowledgeable about the child, persons knowledgeable about the meaning of evaluation data, and persons knowledgeable about placement options. Um, uh, two nights ago in, in Dr. Lamb and I's uh, grad class, um, we, we had a question saying that it was a teacher. It was a great question. You know, we had a, an IEP meeting that we were talking about OT and PT, but the OT and PT specialist who could interpret that data weren't there. What should I have done? We went ahead and we had the meeting. We gave the kids services. What should I have done? Um, and and this is this is the hard part because time is is of the essence. But in that specific case, the IEP meeting should have been tabled at that time. It should have been the the, the LEA rep should have said, okay, we can't proceed because we've got to have these people here to talk about this. Um, and and you all. A summary of what they would say or an email of what they would say is really not going to hold up if that would ever go to mediation or, or end up in court. Um, you need those people present. Um, again, I know it's it's really hard sometimes for the scheduling piece, but, but a lot of times what makes scheduling hard is we wait to the last minute to schedule these IEP meetings. Um, but again, they, they should have tabled the meeting. And, and that doesn't mean that the meeting has to, to end, but that assistant principal should have got on the phone with the OT or PT, tried to Zoom them in, tried to get them on speakerphone some way so that they could have um, interpretation of that data so that they could make true and accurate decisions to best support the student. Um, so, so again, she said, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, you probably should have should have another IEP meeting to bring those the OT and PT in and then let them interpret the results and make sure that the decisions you made at the IEP team meeting were in line with what those results were. So again, just keep that in mind. You need the key people at the table when you're having these meetings and, and scheduling conflicts, again, is not going to hold up as a reason why they weren't there. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, the, the, the best practices there do not hold meetings if you can't have all the key stakeholders present. And then the second one, LEA reps should always be present and involved in IEP team decisions. Again, this is my, my best practice to you all is when you're scheduling IEP meetings, that they be before school, after school, or on work days. Um, it is it is impossible. It's almost impossible for you as an AP or an LEA rep to be completely focused in an IEP meeting when there's school going on in the background. You're distracted by your cell phone. You're distracted by your walkie. You're distracted by student discipline. Um, and, and that is when we make errors in IEP team meetings is when the LEA rep is not truly focused on what the discussion is. Um, again, I understand the day-to-day -day chaos that you got, you all live in as assistant principals, so that's why I just think it's so important to schedule them at times that you know that you're not, you're not going to be bothered and that you can truly be focused. I was incredibly guilty of sitting in an IEP meeting, and when it came to the, the question, does everybody agree, I just shook my head because I trusted people in my IEP team. Um, and and that if I could go back and slap myself, I would, uh, because that's that was not best practice. 
one of the things that, I, that saved me is that when I wasn't an assistant principal, we lived in a world where there wasn't a lot of teacher turnover, um, especially in the districts where I worked. Our EC teachers had been there for many years, so they had experience, they had, had knowledge, but I, I assume that this is probably happening in your district, that, that it's hard to find EC teachers, it's hard to find consistent people to, to fill those roles. Um, and as we continue to hire newer, new EC teachers that don't have that experience, it becomes much more important for there to be someone, the LEA rep, in that IEP meeting, making sure that we are being compliant and to ultimately do what's best for the kid and keep us out of a lawsuit. Right? All right, children in private schools. Um, I, the best practice here is, is you've got to be informed of your district's procedures regarding children in private schools or, or home schools um, or any school or any student that really doesn't attend a traditional public school. Um, so the LEA where the private school is located uh, must uh, implement child find. So if you've got uh, if you've got private schools around your schools, um, those students do fall under your capacity for child find. Um, and also know that private schools or pri parents can't parents from students of private schools can request an evaluation. And we as public LEAs must conduct that evaluation or must have a meeting to determine if that evaluation is actually needed in an initial meeting. Um, so the LEAs must treat child find pr procedures for children in private schools, just as you would for children in your schools. Um, and again, this is child find, not necessarily the IEP team implementation or the IEP implementation. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but that includes all the activities involved, the costs and the completion period. So there's still those timelines, the 90 day timeline in, uh, in particular. I, this is a good place to kind of stop. Is, do, do we have any questions or are we good to just hear me keep on rambling? Dr. Sane, I do have a question. So for private schools, are we responsible for providing services for those students as well? So we, I, I do have this on a slide, but the answer to that is yes, if the IEP team determines that the student needs specific services. Um, but in most cases, it's it that's that's delivered through an IEP or a, a, a services plan. Um, but again, I, I, this is where I want to caution you because, it, for example, in Lincoln County or in Newton Conover City, where I taught, we had very specific protocols and, and procedures about how we made private school decisions. Um, and the actual EC policy and the compliance is pretty vague. Um, and I, I I hope I'm not going to offend anybody with saying this, but our North Carolina Department of Public Instruction sometimes likes to be vague and let school districts kind of figure out how we would interpret those laws. But if we interpret them incorrectly, some, we get our hands slapped. Um, but so so again, it, it all comes down to the student. In my experience, um, you know, nine times out of 10, we did not provide the services or parents denied those services because we would have provided them at our schools. Um, so. So I apologize, I can't answer that question specifically, but I, anytime, this, this is what I also say, anytime there is a private school IEP meeting, always contact your EC director or your EC department so that they can give you specifics on, they're not predetermining anything, but you basically just, just getting your arsenal of knowledge ready so that if you do have a student that possibly does need um, services because of the severity of their disability and you all think as an IEP team that it should be through an IEP, then there are specific procedures from your from your district. Does that help? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, but, so, but, but please know, this is the next slide, please know that no parentally placed private school child has the individual right to receive some or all of the special, special education services or related services that they would receive if they're enrolled in a public school. Okay, so it is, you have some private school parents who are going to knock on your door and say that you must serve my child and you must serve my child at their private school. And that is simply not correct. We must identify, find, and evaluate um, and, and determine that services may be needed, but we no parent has the right to have services that children in public schools would, okay? Um, so if a, if a private school child has been designated to receive services, they must have a service plan that meets the requirements of an IEP and be consistently reviewed and revised. Um, and if there is support from the public school is needed, it would be write, written into the IEP, okay? Um, so you can see how that's very vague language and your district EC department will have some specific interpretations um, that, that um, 
that you would comply with. I don't want to give you what my experience is because that may be a little bit different than what than what you need to do in your district. All right. Um, so let's talk about parental consent. Um, so the best practice here is to make every effort possible to obtain parental consent through multiple ways of communication. And then you should document all those attempts. Um, so the LEA, any, anytime there is an, an initial evaluation, um, whether it be from a private school, whether it be from a teacher, an agency, or a parent, the LEA must provide notice and obtain informed consent before conducting that evaluation. And that informed consent would be at an initial evaluation meeting. Um, and please know that parental consent for an initial evaluation is not consent or, or any evaluation is not consent for services, um, that you have to obtain additional consent to actually provide services. This initial evaluation or evaluations in general are only there to identify additional support that may be needed. The exceptions to this rule are consent is not required of children who are wards of the state um, or, the, or their parents' rights have been removed from a judge. Um, and LEAs can proceed without parent consent, but you must ensure that those procedural safeguards have been put in place. We'll talk about those procedural safeguards at the end of this presentation. Um, but, but again, I go back to this. If you, let's say you send an email to a parent or a Google Calendar invite asking them to come to an IEP meeting and they don't respond to that, do not have the IEP meeting because you have got to show that you have tried and went above and beyond in getting that parent to the meeting. Again, you know, there's no specific how many, you know, I always get the question, well, how many times should I? And, and I, my response is as many as it takes to get them there. And then I also know that after a while you run into, they're just not, they're just not responding. But if you can show that you have went above and beyond and the student really needs to have this initial evaluation, you could proceed. I just, I, again, it's always, we always get in that area of, of non-compliance when we don't have parental consent. Again, talk to your EC director or your EC team about specifics, about how many times there may be specific protocols and procedures. But again, I, it's got to be more than an email. It's got to be more than a phone call. you got to have some house visits in there. I mean, it's got to be multiple ways of communication, your social worker, um, you know, any, any way you can get these parents in for meetings, do it. Uh, we live in a world of Zoom that's helped a little bit um, or online meetings, but still face-to-face -face, parents there um, is going to is going to lead you down a road of, of, of true compliance when we're talking about all these policies. All right, so per, parental consent in general, the LEA is responsible for making FAPE available um, and must uh, obtain informed consent or make a reasonable effort to, to gain that consent from the parent before services can begin. Um, here is a big one. If a parent refuses services, so we've determined a student eligible, we've drafted an IEP, we're proposing, let's just say, inclusion services in reading. If the parent refuses those services, then the school does not have to provide them and we will not be providing, we will not be violating FAPE. Um, I get, I've always got a lot of questions. Well, if we as an IEP team is to have determined them eligible, we said they need these services. The parent says, no, we're not providing that student their free and appropriate public education. Parents, if they deny it, FAPE is not denied. All right. Any questions about that? Just make sure that if parents deny services, that it is documented in the prior written notice, that it is documented in, in any type of note-taking procedures that your district may require, make sure that it is always documented and documented well. Okay, so, oh yeah, go ahead. So if, uh, if you do make contact with a parent and they're just saying, uh, conduct it all without me, I'm not interested, we're, we're, can you just document that as a, uh, your attempts to communication, an attempt to convince them to participate and they refuse. Yeah. So honestly, I would if 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 I were in, in your district and I and I heard that, I would say that's not acceptable for the parent not to, to be there. So you've got to, so if the parent says that, you're going to say, okay, you're going to continue to, to encourage them to come. But let's say that they say that and there's there's five days before the IEP, I would make an attempt to call that parent every day or have somebody in my building call that parent every day and have them refuse five times over. 
Um, I, I just, I can't, again, and then you would document that. But again, I would offer them a Zoom option. I would offer them a phone call. Um, anything you can do to uh, put them on speakerphone in the IP, anything you can do to, to get them there. But if they just flat out refuse, then yes, document it. But again, I would have them flat out refuse more than once. Does that, does that help? Dr. Sane. Yes. Are we documenting everything in the prior written notice? I, I'm sorry, you broke out just a little bit there. What was that? Are we documenting everything in the prior written notice? Yes. Like the the meeting, the denial in the prior written notice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. Again, do you, you might want to talk to your EC director about that or your EC compliance, but I, everything needs to, in my opinion, I dumped everything in that prior written notice just because that's the best place for it. Um, now, also you have your communication logs as an assistant principal that, that, and all of that information there. I, I had my APs always have like a Google drive of, of notes, um, that, that they kept as well. So that, you know, cause you're not always having that you, you have to collect data or, or document things, and then you could take it to your IP team. But but again, I would put it all in that that uh, PWN. All right. Um, one thing I want to mention about referrals um, is schools must act when there is a suspicion of disability. Okay, and this is this is recently came out of this this new SLD policy. It's always been in place, but it's really been highlighted. There are a lot of parent groups that are starting to sue districts because we're not acting on suspicions of disability. Um, and so mo the most reliable suspicions of disability are driven by data. And, and we're going to talk about MTSS in just a second. But listen, if you have a student who has continually performed, performed below grade level multiple years, and there has never been any act to suspect a disability, that's probably a problem. And so when we think about MTSS, you always say, well, the student hasn't been in intervention, or there's all these primary factors, or we've got to collect all of this data. The state has specifically come back and said, we cannot wait on procedures that the school has not done and delay acting on the possible suspicion of a disability. Um, so if you have students in your building who you suspect as an AP or your teachers suspect as, as a student with a disability, we have to act on it. We can't say, oh, we need to get eight weeks worth of data um, or we, we have to run nine weeks of intervention. If that student has a historical, um, you know, underperformance and, you know, we have, and this happened, this is very common with students who have good behavior, they have strong worth ethic, they just might be a little bit below grade level, um, and they've always constantly underperformed, um, that they kind of, we kind of miss them on that MTSS radar. That's why it's so important to have strong MTSS frameworks and make sure that we're not missing kids who are consistently performing below that 25th percentile. So just remember, regardless of the MTSS structures that the state says we must have in place, this is where it gets confusing. You must do this for MTSS. However, if you're not doing it, you still must refer if you have students who are consistently performing below grade level. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. So um, initial evaluations, each LEA must conduct um, a full and individual evaluation before special education or related services could be given to a child. Um, the IEP team determines if the child has a disability um, and evaluations must be conducted, eligibility determined for the eligibility or for the eligible child and an IEP developed and placed within 90 days of the referral. So let's talk about that 90 day deadline. That is, um, 90 days is, is how long the whole process should take. Um, so, but every district has, has different rules in place. So for example, in Lincoln County, we had trouble with our IEP teams getting things done in 90 days. We said it had to be done in 70. And the reason why that districts put some of those sooner deadlines in place is, is as you know, you could get to an IEP meeting and the, and the parent says, I don't agree with this. I want this, I want this, or I think we need additional evaluations. And that should be allowed to happen. That conversation should be allowed to happen. So if you call an, an eligibility meeting on the 89th day and the parent doesn't agree, but says they want additional evaluations, are you gonna be in compliance? Um, and the answer is no. So it, I always, as a teacher, you know, I, and, and actually when I first started teaching, I had to get it done in 60 days. 
um, so that we had a month to make changes if needed. So I would inform your teachers that that 90 days is not when that, that's not how much time we have. Everything should be finished, including changes to the IEP and services implemented within that 90 day period. Um, so, so again, as an LEA rep, you know, we want to empower our EC teachers to keep up with their schedules, but you've also got to monitor those schedules, share those that EC teachers need to share their calendars with you. They, you know, it, you know, I did it as an AP. I just said, send me at the beginning of the year, send me a list of who has their, their reevaluations or, uh, due or their evaluations due. Add it to this list as you go through it. Some, some people have calendars shared with them. Again, there just must be, you must be overseeing that process to make sure that we're in compliance with those meetings or with those, those timelines. All right, so when you conduct evaluations, um, we're going to get into so, some of the specifics and some of the things that that the information, there is so much information that, that LEA reps are required to know. Um, I'm going to briefly touch, you know, skim the surface. Um, and I didn't, I didn't um, say this at the beginning, but as, as an LEA, when I was an LEA, when I supported APs in, in making sure that we were compliant, I told them to take the Policies Governing Children with Disabilities, that book that you have linked to at the beginning of this presentation, it's about 100 pages. I printed out a copy, put that in a binder, and I took it everywhere with me um, because it is impossible for us to know every, every piece of EC policy and legislation and compliance, but it's not impossible for us to have a book where we can refer, where we can write in, where we can highlight. I wish you could see my first one. It was the old one. Uh, I told the other class last night, it stinks. It's got coffee all over it. I mean, there's probably... Uh, student snot on it from I, I mean it's just it's but I took it everywhere with me it's flagged it's highlighted it's written in um, so that I could answer questions that I maybe didn't know um, but when we get into th these evaluations IEP teams must um, provide notice to parents we talked about that but you must use a variety of assessment tools you can't use any one single measure to identify, and you must use sound instruments that assess. Yeah, you must use sound instruments to assess. Okay. What was that? <laughs> you, you sounded like Mickey Mouse for a second. <laughs> oh, I did? Oh, gosh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Adam, what was the last thing I said before I sounded like Mickey Mouse? That one single measurement of um, that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so so we can't we can't identify students based off any one assessment, um, and we must use sound instruments. And so, what does that mean? Um, I'm not going to go over all of this, but from pages 60 through 62 to 72, um, you have a list of the required screenings and evaluation for eligibility determination in each of the 14 categories. All right. So if you have a student who the IEP team is considering autism. Um, you want to make sure in that initial meeting as the LEA rep that you have all of the assessments listed and you're getting consent for all of the assessments listed to be compliant. All right. So under each of those those 10 pages, it says well, for autism, here's what you need to accurately identify autism in North Carolina. Here's what you need to identify multiple disabilities, intellectual disabilities, speech and language. OK, so I'm not saying that you have, need to have those memorized. But I'm saying that you need to take this book with you to those IEP meetings and make sure, especially if you have new EC teachers, that you are requesting and getting consent for all of the evaluations that you need. Because if you don't, it is very, it's very annoying for you, for educators to get that IEP team back together to say, oh, you know what, we forgot to request an educational evaluation. So we need to have an IEP team meeting again to get parent consent. Um, you know, I, there have been cases and, and your district may allow this to where you could do a phone conference with all of that and, and get that additionally signed. I always said face to face in person is our number one priority. Um, if there's special circumstances arise that we need to have additional meetings and it needs to be online, we can do that. But again, face to face in person parent in the school is 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 the best practice. So. We're going to come back to specific learning disabilities in just a second, because that is that is the bulk of, of what you'll probably be doing in your buildings. Um, but, but let's go over reevaluations right quick. Um, the LEA must ensure a timely evaluation, a reevaluation for a child for children with disabilities. Um, and those reevaluations must occur if there's an improved academic achievement or functional performance. 
if um, if data suggests that the student is regressing and that there needs to be a change in placement or change in service delivery, um, if the parent or teacher requests additional reevaluation data. Um, so evaluations may not occur more than once in a year. Um, the only exception to that is if the IEP team and the parent agrees that there should be one with, you know, after six months has, has went through. But again, it, that's the only exception there. And evaluations must occur every three, or re-evaluations must occur every three years. So here, go ahead. Was there a question? I thought I heard. All right. Okay. Um, let, let me talk about this, the, the, like the three years. If, you know, a lot of districts interpret that and we make mistakes sometimes with saying, oh, we only have to reevaluate them every three years. So we, if we see a student is regressing or we see that their academic performance is, perform is, is improving, we should act you know, before that three year period, um, at, you know, because if if, for example, if a child is regressing and we don't act on it, um, then then if that goes to mediation or if that goes to a to a lawsuit, then then we are not responding to the specific needs of the child. So I'm just saying that as a disclaimer. Yes, we have three years to reevaluate. But if there is a pressing need um, that that arises, we should reevaluate when that need arises. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about MTSS and RTI um, and how that relates to specific learning disability. So this changed in July 2020. I'm sorry. You had a question. You had a question. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm going back to evaluations. So okay. is it best practice that we are looking at more than one area? Um, to avoid over-identification. So for example, I have a student that's performing low, but also has some um, behavioral issues. Would I not look at um, you know, like maybe ED and SLD? I mean, or does it matter? Does that matter? Does that every, district that I've worked, every district that I've worked for required two. You looked at two areas, two categories. Um, there, there may be specific protocols in your district that says that you should look at two. I, it's just, to me, like you just said, it is best practice to look at two because again, if we're only looking at one, we're kind of predetermining that student's disability before we ever get any of the evaluation results back. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of times with, with behavior, you know, you could look at emotional disability, you could look at specific learning disability because a lot of times student behavior is driven by the fact that they're not performing you know, adequately in the school. So you could look at SLD, you know, you could look at other health impairment. Um, I would, I would sit down because remember the IEP team doesn't make decisions until evaluations, evaluation data is back. But at that initial meeting, I would, you know, you talk, you talk globally about the student. And then as the LEA rep, um, you would say, well, listen, this, this kind of resembles a student, you know, he had, he's diagnosed with ADHD we probably should look at other health impairment because do we know whether the ADHD is driving the deficit or is the learning deficit driving the behavior? Kind of those conversations. So yes, I think it's best practice to always look at multiple, multiple areas. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. So um, determining a specific learning disability in North Carolina used to be fairly easy. Um, if it used to be you, you we use the discrepancy model. You you looked at an aptitude test, an achievement test that was giving after a parent gave consent. You look for a fifteen point discrepancy. I'm I'm generalizing that, but if there was a fifteen point discrepancy, the student would identify as a student with a specific learning disability. And in July of 2020, we changed that. Um, we went from the discrepancy model to a to a problem solving or an RTI approach where you have to, school districts or school LEAs have to prove that the student is not responding to intervention, they've been provided intervention, and that their rate of improvement is not at a rate that will close their gap over an appropriate period of time, which are all those basic components of MTSS. And so in most, of, in most cases, school assistant principals, um, if they're not overseeing the school's MTSS or RTI framework, they're at least a part of that team. Um, and, and if you're not, if you're not a part of that MTSS RTI team and you're an LEA rep, I would strongly suggest that you become a part of both or have some type of communication method with the MTSS chair so that you are aware of what's going on in that MTSS framework, because a majority of your IEP team meetings are going to be about students with learning disabilities. 
Um, and, and there are, again, in the wake of us coming back from COVID, there have been a ton of lawsuits or complaints across the state about LEAs not complying with the MTSS procedures and protocols when identifying students with learning disabilities. Um, so the, the biggest thing, the, the best practices is that um, your school-based MTSS procedures and protocols must be compliant with EC policy. Um, you know, as I said, don't use the discrepancy model, but you must oversee and ensure that data must be collected from a regular education regarding the student's academic performance, their response to evidence-based intervention, their rate of improvement, um, and evidence that primary factors have been ruled out. Um, and, and listen, I'm not here to speak poorly of educators um, because I know that they have so much on their plates. But I have been a part of many IEP meetings where educators will say, we provided intervention, we progress monitored, the student's not responding, they need SLD, look at this data sheet, it's got all this fancy data on it, and then come to find out none of that actually happened. Um, so it is so important that you ensure that the teachers who are responsible for providing those interventions are doing them, that the data is accurate, and that Here's another thing, we, we've gotten into this kind of um, this uh, habit of just collecting data to collect data and then not interpreting data. So, I, for example, I, I had to I was requested to sit in on an IEP meeting for a pr pretty contentious uh, IEP or a student who, who had some parents who were not the friendliest. Um, and they started presenting the data and the IEP team was getting ready to make the decision that they were going to qualify the student. But the data suggested that the kid was making improvements and on their rate of improvement graphs, it actually had the kid projected to be above grade level by the end of the year. And you know, in that meeting, I had to kind of say, whoa, wait a minute. Your, your data says that the kid doesn't have a learning disability. Your, your data says that the interventions are working. Um, so again, just make sure that 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 data that regular education provides the IEP team has been interpreted um, and that these truly are students who require specific learning disabilities because I'm going to tell you if there is not a strong framework an MTSS framework in your buildings and there's not someone overseeing that framework your SLD identifications are going to go through the roof because it is it is it, it can be fairly easy to just push kids through the system now because we don't have that discrepancy model is this new is this new pathway to SLD? Is it more effective? Is it more accurate in identifying students? Yes, but it has to be an effective and strong implementation to do so. Does that make sense? All right. So um, the development of the IEP, um, the IEP team must consider strengths of the child, parent concerns, results of the evaluation. Um, the needs of the child, if there are any additional factors such as behavior, communication, ELL, any related services that might need, um, need to be provided. And here is one that in pages 82, 80 to 82, it is very clear. The regular education teacher of the child must participate in the development of the IEP and be a member of the IEP team. Not the music teacher, not the PE coach, not the first teacher you can randomly grab to get to be in an IEP meeting. This is one of the things that I think we do the most often. The teacher can't be there, so we grab someone else. There are going to be cases where it's it's impossible to to make sure that the teacher is there, but but they need to be on a phone call. They need to be on Zoom. Just basically like like parents, that teacher is 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 so important for the development of the IEP. So just make sure that the teacher is there. Um, and then you need to review and revise the IEP at least annually, and then always ensure that parents are, um, are, are informed. So IEP teams should write the IEP, but LEA reps, in because you're part of the IEP team, you're going to be helping write the IEP, but in the back of your mind, your main goal is to make sure that there is compliance in that IEP, that every member is at the table, that we're we're asking for the right evaluations, that we're, we're really looking at least restrictive environment, that we're offering all placements or a continuum of placements, um, and that we're ensuring that this IEP supports the student's academics to close their achievement gap, all right, their academics and their behavior or their specific disability. Okay, so where, 
what, what scares so many people about EC is this right here, parents and suing and lawsuit and advocacy groups. And you have every right to be scared because they, there are so many of them out there. And there, there are people who are constantly watching us as public educators make mistakes, right? We, we do great work 99.9% .9 of the time, but there are no groups out there really looking at that. They're looking at that point one where we do make some decisions that, that sometimes are, are, um, are not compliant. But again, we've got to worry about that because we've got, we've got a magnifying glass on us. So if you do the things that we've already talked about, you're going to be in good shape. But then let's say that you do have a parent who is upset and or or there's a, you know, uh, a group that comes in, uh, you know, an advocate that comes in and says you've done things incorrectly. That it's OK. We can we can make corrections and we try to, to avoid going to court. Um, and there are a lot of safeguards in place for us to do that. Um, but one of the first steps that you always got to do is make sure that parents are notified of their rights and the safeguards are, that are in place for them and their students. OK, so you have a link there to the notice of procedural rights. It is a pretty lengthy document as well. But uh, for the sake of time. I'm not going to go into to that and and but but again I would read it I would you know collaborate with your EC department make sure that you understand what your specific procedures and policies are um, so they're the best practices have a strong understanding of the procedural safeguards the compliance is notifying parents of their safeguards notifying parents of EC students of their safeguards once a year I always said notify parents every time they're in an IEP meeting. Every time you have them and we're, we're talking about your student with a disability, notify them of their procedural um, safeguards. Uh, it's just best practice. So what are the procedural um, safeguards? Um, independent evaluation. So if a parent doesn't really agree with the evaluations that you've conducted and at the building, they can request an independent evaluation. We as LEAs must provide that. Um, and then that evaluation must be considered in the evaluation results. Um, prior written notice, parental consent, access to records. Parents should always have access to records. Um, listen, here's here is a, a, a helpful hint. As an LEA, if you are, all of your IEPs should be drafted and should be ready to go um, in, in a draft form. You know, there should be at least something. And, and then you, you talk about them and you add stuff in during the IEP meeting. However, a lot of teachers sometimes don't do that. They, they, they write it down, but then they don't go back in and they don't add what's in the IEP, what was discussed in the IEP team meeting. Um, and then they forget about it. So then let's say a parent requests a record and you have an incomplete IEP. Um, and the teacher says, oh, I'll get that to you in 10 days. Never delay a parent's access to records because we haven't done our part. Um, we had a case where I dealt with it that, that a student tried to um, not to get into detail commit suicide. The, the parent wanted to put them into a, a psychiatric hospital. They needed the most updated IEP. The teacher had not updated it, hadn't sent it to the parent. So we were we were not compliant in several several ways. Um, but we the teacher did not send it um, to the parent. The kid did not get into did not get the treatment. The parent filed a complaint. Always send records, but more importantly, also always make sure those records are truly reflective of what happened um, and that there's not there, there's not anything incomplete in those records. Um, procedural safeguards also involve due process hearings. You know, always allow your parents and students due process. Always. That's just good school in every situation. Um, it talks about the avail availability of mediation, child placement during um due process and procedures who are subject to an alternative school placement, civil actions and attorney fees. It goes into a lot of stuff that, that parents have, have rights to. Um, so just make sure you inform them. Now, when you inform them, you don't have to go over all of that. You, most districts just have a document that they hand to the parents so that they know their rights and they know that what they're guaranteed. Uh, but you do need to have knowledge of this in case that comes up and they start talking about it. So um, discipline procedures, we got 10 minutes, I can do this. Um, all right, so school personnel may consider any unique circumstance on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so every kid is different. Um, and, and, and especially when we're determining if a change in placement is appropriate for a student who violates the, the code of student conduct. So a child who is removed from their current placement must continue to receive services 
um, to ensure that progress, that they can still meet progress toward their annual IEP goals. All right. And they must receive appropriate behavioral intervention services to address the behaviors um, so that they do not occur. All right. So the best practices with this, when you have EC students who have behaviors, you have EC students specifically who have behaviors, but that might not be their primary disability. Go ahead and be proactive. Again, if you have an EC student who has a pattern of behavior, go ahead and conduct an FBA. Go ahead and conduct a BIP. Make it a part of the IEP um, so that if this ever becomes a problem in the future, we don't have to do, we don't have to do all that work in an expedited fashion to get the student support. Um, and so another best practice is ensure educator compliance when implementing behavior plans. You don't know how many times we've done all the work to implement the behavior plans, but then it's not implemented. We just think that, oh, we have it on record. We're good. No, it's got to actually be implemented in every area that the student goes in the building. Um, so within 10 days of a change of placement, the IEP team must determine was the conduct caused by the child's disability, um, or was the conduct in question uh, due to a result of the LEA's lack to or, or failure to implement an, the IEP? Um, and that those are the manifestation meetings. It's 97 through 98. Um, we get a lot of like a lot of anxiety about manifestation determinations. Um, and truly, manifestation determinations are there to support the kid, but more importantly, support the school and the educators um, when providing support for the student. Um, so the conduct must be determined to be one of those two, um, and it was if it was a manifestation. Um, so changes in placement, um, and remember the best practice there: do not wait to act just because you have ten days. And Dr. Lamb, you might want to you might want to ch uh, chime in on this because you do a better sermon on this than I do. But again, you have ten days. But that doesn't mean you have to wait 10 days or saying comments like, oh, he's only got we've only suspended him for three days. We got seven more days till we have to do anything. That's not going to hold up in court. And I'm going to tell you, I got I got bitten by this as a school administrator. I had a student with severe behaviors, had an IEP, was in an alternative placement, um, hurt his teacher. We suspended him for five days. We did not do anything differently because. I said, we have five more days. That student came back, hurt his teacher again. We didn't, we failed to act. That teacher filed a complaint against me and we lost, okay? Um, so just because you have 10 days, doesn't mean you don't act. If you have a student's behavior who is severe enough to act, you need to act before 10 days. You need to have a manifestation meeting. You need to talk about the student's behavior and figure out plans to support it. Dr. Lamb, you wanna add your spiel yeah, there? I'm here. Um, the five things you see on the screen um, as the person responsible to have to go to court, uh, I've lost all five of these, by the way, I'm over. Um, and so, you know, I always tell the truth on myself. Um, so let me run through these quickly. We'll keep an eye on time here. Out of school suspensions. This one linked back to not putting suspensions in power school, bootlegging suspensions to keep the numbers down just across the board in a high school. Some of them were EC kids, and by the time we figured out that they were not entering all their data in in a timely manner into power school, we had kids that exceeded the 10-day limit on out-of-school suspension. Uh, next case, we had people who were, instead of doing out-of-school as a code of conduct, they were doing in-school thinking that wasn't a change of placement. That, you know, don't think you're hurting the team. Um, stick with what you're good at. That in-school suspension counts. It's a change of placement. Um, bus suspensions, uh, lost that one at a middle school. Um, they were, they were counting everything that the kid did, no matter what it was, if it was a fight or a sexual assault, they were counting that as bus misbehavior and doing bus suspensions. That counts. Um, and then, um, we used a system in CMS, was kind of a precursor to PBIS, where we were rolling kids, bouncing them into classrooms, doing those kinds of things, that's a change of placement too. Lost that one. Uh, so if you, and I know in PBIS, there's a lot of that, changing schedules and rolling kids and bouncing. 
uh, in PBIS, if you do that, uh, if you move him from where he normally sits every day in the room that he sits in, that's a change in placement. You'll lose that one. And then the last one, as Dr. Sane said, um, lost, lost this one in that schools acted like we were asking them to give them their first child or give blood to do a manifestation determination. Now, again, you've got to do the DEC-5. You've got to do the functional behavior assessment, behavior intervention plan. You've got to do updated psychological and update the IEP. It is a lot of paperwork, but it's not, you got two weeks. It's not, it, it's not time for, or activity prohibited, but they would, they would, a kid that should have gotten five days would get one. We'll just give him one every time. That way we got, you know, but, the third time the kid does the same thing, you better go straight to that manifestation because like Dr. Sane says, that fourth time he does something and he hurts somebody, a kid or a teacher, you're in trouble. And that's when you pay the big money is when somebody gets hurt. So this this is, you know, Dr. Sane did his presentation. This is this is my, he's, he's redone my slide, thank goodness, because I'm not a good person to do that. But um, you can tell I, I'm, I'm way behind him on this, but I can tell you I've got scars on my body from these and you will have them too. So don't be that person who, who doesn't understand what change of placement is. That's the one that's going to get you the biggest on discipline of EC kids is change of placement. Thank you. All right. So that kind of, um, that wraps us up, uh, but I just I, I did want to leave with with these kind of big tips for you um, as you guys embark on this EC compliance journey. Um, again, I've said it: always refer to the manual. Always, always bring it with you. Um, Listen, I have been doing this for almost 20 years, and I still have to refer to the policy. I still have to call people because it is so much. Um, and I always, I still prepare myself for any IEP meeting that I have to have to come into. And this is the thing as an AP, you know who your contentious IEPs are going to be. You already know. You know who those parents are. Don't drop the ball with those parents. Now, I'm not saying you drop the ball with any parent. You got to treat every parent the same. But you know who the parents are that are going to cause you cause you extended concerns and, and extended time and resources. Be prepared as you can be. Um, but that that manual is always going to to um, to support you with that. Know your district's interpretations of that manual. So as you're reading and going through that manual, as you maybe if you're going through it with these slides, um, ask questions to your EC team. Say how what is our interpretation of this? What do we do for this? What do we specifically do for this? Um, when you're unsure, ask questions. Be proactive. Be prepared. I said that if there are, are concerns in an IEP meeting, this is the big. This is where we all have to, you know, swallow a big piece of humble pie. If the IEP meeting is going in a direction where you really don't know what's going on, uh, or you're unsure of what's going on, or you have this gut feeling that what you're doing is wrong, stop the meeting immediately. Just stop it. Just say, you know what, we need to stop the meeting. We need to reconvene. I, we need to get some additional information. Or just stop it. I mean, you don't even have to, to say, you know, why? Just stop the meeting. Because if you continue having that meeting, that's when problems arise. Um, and again, you can stop the meeting for 15 or 20 minutes. I told my LEA reps, if you're uncomfortable about what's going on or you're about or you're unsure about how to proceed, stop it for 10 minutes. Call me. Call somebody that, that knows the answer. Get the answer. Come back to the IEP meeting and lead the IEP or, or, or finish it up. Um, you know, make every effort or attempt to keep parents informed and involved. Um, each child's disability is unique. Um, don't expect a playbook about how to support each individual student. And I'm going to tell you this, IP should not look the same. All right. It's a lot of paperwork, but it is very clear when there's a lot of copying and pasting. All right. And when you start copying and pasting student goals, student le present levels of performance, that's a problem. Um, every kid is unique and just make sure you remember that. Um, and then the last thing is just always maintain confidentiality. I didn't tell, share this story, but you know, you can talk about an EC student, 
um, with teachers, uh, with interventionists, you know, informally, if it's specifically pertaining to school or school procedures about how resources that, that they need, like if the student work runs out of this resource, we need to order this, or if there's some data that's highlighted, um, that you say, okay, let's talk about this right quick. So it's okay to have those informal EC conversations, but as soon as it turns, as soon as that conversation turns to specifically involving placement of the students, direct services of the student, stop that conversation and call an IEP meeting. Um, and do not talk about EC students in a public setting. Um, I, I had an assistant principal when I was a principal who went to a teacher in the hallway, asked about the student's data, Another teacher walked by who just happened to be friends with that student's parent, saw that parent at a baseball field that night, said, oh, I walked by, they were talking about your kid today. Guess who was at my door the next morning wanting to know why I was talking about the student's IEP without that parent present? Um, and had she had she filed a complaint, that would have been on us. So again, if you're anytime you're talking about any student, don't do it in the hallway. That's just best practice. But again, especially with those EC students or students with the IEP, just ensure you're maintaining confidentiality. Um, and, and, and anything that is specific about the IEP is addressed in an IEP meeting. All right. I think we have just a little bit of time. Or no, we don't actually went over. I apologize. But y'all have any quick questions for me? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be any. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. I hope I do hope it was meaningful for you. Um, I, Dr. Lamb, okay, will, will we share my contact information with everybody? Yes, we will. Uh, well, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, email, phone, I'll be glad to support uh, you in, in this journey. When I send the video later today, after we process and upload the video, um, I will uh, I will send the video and I will resend this slide presentation. I sent it. You should have all gotten it maybe Wednesday night. Uh, I will resend the slideshow, the link to today's video and Dr. Sain's contact information. I will share all that as normal when we wrap up. Dr. Sain, I want to thank you. Um, Dr. Sain's been in the business for 20 years and, and he's an expert and he still has to ask things. Oh, you know, I've been in the business. This is my 45th year. And, and I don't know what I know wouldn't fill a thimble, unfortunately. Um, and so I said that to say this, all of you sitting in that room or online with us today, your goal is to be a principal. Now, number one thing that normally gets you as a principal is uh, money or, 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 or this. Well, since you as assistant principal don't sign the checks, it's this. This is what will prevent you from getting that next level and unfortunately may cause you to lose your house. Um, th this, this is the number one thing for an assistant principal. Uh, number one is you got to know this stuff. If you don't know, ask. That's what I was referring to. I'm 40, 45 years in and I have to ask all the time. I go to all the updates, the legal briefs. You know, I, I, I wear the seats out trying to learn this stuff, but it's impossible to keep up with it all. It's impossible to know it all. you got to be willing to ask. If you don't know, ask. Um, and so th this, this is the one. Of all these modules that we're doing with you through this series, this is the one that you're going to have to, unless you've been an, a, a current EC teacher like last week, you, you're going to have to grind on this one. And th there's no easy path. Uh, that's, the, that, that's my closing of the benediction here. I hear just as I am playing in the background. So we're at the benediction here. Um, um, there's no easy path. Some things you just got to grind it out. This is one of those things. We appreciate the time and as always, and uh, appreciate the partnership. We're honored to be with you. If you have any questions, we'll, an we'll answer those. If not, we'll be back on next month. I believe I'm up with master scheduling in April and then in May, uh, I'm hoping to join you if I get an invite uh, just to have a round table discussion on all the things that we've gone over this spring. Uh, I hope that you find value in this. So I'll close out with any questions from the group. Well, it was good to Seems see you hard, all. Though. All right, I believe we are adjourned then. So everybody have a good week, good weekend. Hope your spring break goes well. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Welcome. Bye-bye.